thank you for coming this morning. It's a pleasure to, an honor to speak before you. This topic is uh, near and dear to our hearts uh, at the Dolly Museum and for me uh, in my career. So I want to uh, explore what it might mean, the beyond. What does that mean? And, and we always look to artists, to poets, to uh, musicians to take us to a, a new idea. So the beyond. Uh, there's a poet named Jorge Guillén, uh, a Spanish poet, uh, who writes, El alma vuelve a corazón. Se dirige a los ojos y choca, luz me invade todo mi ser. And he says that the light uh, enters the body through the eyes and it shocks us and it fills our entire being. So this concept of being invaded by something beyond uh, that is finally taking possession of us. That's one concept of the beyond, something that becomes internalized. Um, we look to this interesting scientist um, who uh, set up this theory of quantum fluctuation, who's known for uh, his work in, uh, developed something called the uncertainty principle, um, has an idea of the beyond. And he created this formula. And if you look on the left side of the equation, there's, there's T, which is time, there's E in energy, and they are in some kind of equilibrium with a constant. So what that means is, as one gets bigger, the other has to get smaller because they equal this constant. So his theory was that in an infinitesimal moment of time, when time gets smaller and smaller until it almost doesn't exist, energy can become infinite. Something can come out of nothing. And I think that's a really amazing idea. He puts it forward not as a personal uh, hope or a principle, but instead his explanation of how the universe arose as a quantum fluctuation out of nothingness. In a way, these two people, a scientist and a poet, have the same idea. They see the beyond as really imminent, as something that lurks, that's inside us or just around the corner, that's waiting for the next moment. And that's something that I personally embrace um, and I'll explain a little bit more about why. But it's wonderful that 160 plus communities are talking about the beyond. Um, and we know that it's a good thing, the beyond. Or I think we assume it is. But why go there? Why do we want to go beyond? Why should we? We go beyond um, because we're curious. We want to see. We go beyond because uh, we want to provoke. This is one of Dolly's drawings of, of a building and a piece of fruit approaching the speed of light. Uh, we go beyond because we want to invent things. And we go to beyond because we want to inspire. And we go beyond because we want to serve. That's a, a fundamental belief, I think, of, of all of us here. We want to get to a better place for ourselves and our community. So how do we get there? Again, we look to the, the poets and artists and to give us an idea. And Leonora Carrington uh, tells us that we all have access to the beyond because we dream. And there's the great dreamer himself, Salvador Dali. And he had an amazing way of capturing his dreams. Very practical. He would uh, take naps. <laughs> But in a special way, he would set himself up in a chair or lying on a couch, and he would drape his arm to the side of wherever he was lying or reclining, holding a key. And below the key, he would place a metal plate. So as he dozed off, his hand would open, the key would fall, and the clatter of that would wake him, and he would have nearby a pencil and paper, and he would write down those images that were furtive there just as he was falling asleep. Those ones that we lose and those ones we can scarcely remember. A great system for going beyond and capturing, uh, capturing great images. 
another way of going beyond is by putting unlike things together. And Max Ernst, the artist and uh, surrealist, wrote that uh, creativity is the marvelous capacity to grasp mutually distinct realities and draw a spark from their juxtaposition. And that word spark is kind of wonderful because if we think of Heisenberg and that sudden eruption of energy, it's also a spark. The idea of the surrealists was that the creative acts issue from this sudden displacement, from this eruption that comes out of dissimilar or irrational juxtapositions. That's why they were always trying to surprise and shock. So one of the things we're doing at the Dalai Museum is the creation of an innovation lab. And uh, I co-direct that with Nathan Schwagler, who I think many of you know. Um, and our, our tenet is, our supposition, our f foundational belief is that by creating environments when you have, can put unlike things together, for instance, uh, the use of art in a business context or uh, the use of, of music in the discussion of, of organizational structures for communities, uh, you can bring in this tension of, of disparate ideas. So the image uh, here is a, of a group that is involved in this activity of uh, divergence and convergence. So using something so simple as post-it notes, you write down an idea of, of how to solve a problem, and then you post them, uh, everybody shares them, and then they try to group them and see similar ideas. And then you can actually kind of just like vote by uh, the number of posts in a certain area. It's a really simple and lovely technique. It's very social and it's, it's very useful in organizations. Let's do an exercise to stimulate innovation. Draw out how your company is organized. Okay. Ah, a typical top-down organization chart. Let's try another drawing. Did you notice your Marilyn appears like the organization chart? hierarchical with extra emphasis on the head? Let's try again, but this time from her big toe. Much better. I can't believe I made that. <laughs> As Dally explained, when you begin with the head, you proceed with all of your assumptions and bad habits of how parts go together and you miss entirely how the pieces of the body work together to create harmony and balance. By beginning with the big toe, your bad mental habits have disappeared. Remember that old log chart you created? What if you tried again, but this time from the big toe? Imagine how you could redraw your organization, rethink and reorient its parts to emphasize its vitality and capabilities. Wow, I never thought of that. Exactly. It's exercises like the big toe that help us expose and understand the hidden assumptions that get in the way of our most exciting plans. To challenge these assumptions and to look upon even our most familiar landscapes with fresh eyes and creative courage is perhaps the finest starting point from which to give birth to new ideas and innovative products and services. I think that that's uh, uh, something that we've really had success with in terms of getting people to think in a new way about their organizational structures. And, uh, you know, we so often do a kind of top down uh, the way we do a Mr. Potato Head when we try to draw the figure. And it's the bad habits, the expectations, uh, the things we're inured to that uh, force us to do that. I'd like to have a proof of concept here for a second. Uh, look at those four images, and when you can make a story out of them, just raise your hand. What's the story? Uh, I went for a walk in the desert. I went for a hike, and it was really, really beautiful. But I got hungry, and so I started thinking of this basket of food that I had at home. So I had to reach into my pocket and search for my key. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, so uh, exactly. So it takes that long, really, to, uh, to organize disparate information and to uh, 
create a narrative. And the human mind is always making stories, right? We want, to, we want the world to make sense. We want to be part of a story. We want the world to be part of our story. So we do this. And that's another foundational belief of our innovation labs, that, you know, that the mind will put things together. The mind will solve these problems. And what we have to do is throw the right things in its path so that it can uh, trip up and come up with new solutions. So some of the other images we, we use, and this is, this is uh, definitely the Dali's um, inventory. So this is, a, this is a painting called Gala, contemplating the Mediterranean Sea. And you see her, right, Gala? She's looking out over the Mediterranean Sea. Is it bright enough to see that in here? Okay, and then uh, if you, you know, unfocus your eyes a little bit, do you see that the whole image becomes Abraham Lincoln? And that's the second part of the title, which at 20 meters becomes a portrait of Abraham Lincoln. So it's a great lesson in close focus and distant focus. Close focus and distant focus. And how's that useful to people? Well, it was useful to us uh, in, in our um, handling our lines here because on busy days, we would have people line up. And there's nothing more discouraging than being in a line and you're in close focus, right? You're looking at your own feet. You know that there's the person in front of you. You're kind of noting who they are so nobody else gets in there. You know who's behind there in case you have to ask them to keep your place because you're going to the restroom. Close focus stuff. But what's the big focus? Big focus is how long until I get there? How far is it to the ticket booth? So when we would have people go through and say, five minutes to the ticket booth or 10 minutes to the ticket booth, we, we reduce the anxiety level of, of waiting for something. So it was a, just a really practical solution that came out of our, of our own paintings. Now here's uh, uh, <laughs> Dolly appropriated an image from Life magazine of, of an interior and uh, then painted these sheep uh, on the inside. So it's a kind of transposition and just thinking of this as a transposition of the inside and the outside, um, I think you get a, an amazing idea of, of how you might use that. For instance, what if you took something that was very personal and made it public? What if you rented out your house? What if you used your car as a taxi? Now, I'm not saying that's the, the origin uh, you know, of Airbnb and uh, Uber, but Looking at, at uh, works like this can really lead, if you're on the track of something like that, to a solution. This is a painting called The Weaning of Furniture Nutrition. Crazy painting, Dali has painted his nursemaid on the beach where he grew up, uh, in the community he grew up, and then he's taken the bedside table from beside his bed, and it's exactly the same size as the, the, the vacuity in the, in the nursemaid's body. And then there's another little cabinet that comes out of that. So um, this is a, a really interesting, there's a thing called the theory of constraint, that when you uh, are building a room or, or even organizing a room for creative mornings, you know, if you uh, make it really small, then you're gonna define the experience. If you make it large, uh, you're gonna give more amplitude and, and ways of moving, proceeding. This is a painting by George Bosselitz, and he always painted upside down, really following Dolly's idea that, um, to break his habits. He didn't want to paint the way the, uh, 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 he didn't want to paint uh, by habit. He wanted to discover painting. So, um, you know, many companies have found that they, if they invert their natural order, for instance, from design to production to sales, and they ask the sales force to tell them what the product should look like, because they've heard from their clients. By turning that natural order, uh, they can really reinvent themselves. Uh, a 17th century Italian artist named Archim Boldo. And you'll see that, that uh, there's a series of vegetables and fruits, uh, which in their composite form uh, a human being. Let's say uh, you wanted to um, distribute water in a third world community. What could you do besides creating containers that are gonna be thrown away? What if you made them in the form of, of, of a log cabin blocks so they were interlocking 
uh, so that you could pour some kind of concrete into them so that you could use them as the superstructure for housing. An idea like that could come from Archimbaldo. Today, while you're here, I encourage you to go outside and into our, um, our labyrinth. Um, the labyrinth is a physical demonstration of this idea that the mind will take you to your destination. You need only to have the faith to, to go, uh, to proceed, to never give up, and the mind solves the problems. So what all this means for me, let me tell you how I came to the beyond. Um, my dad had a, uh, an, an adage that it was the extra five minutes. He was always encouraging me to spend five minutes more. And I would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm already there. I already know it. He says, well, you can be more there. And in the sense I've learned in my life that you can get more there with just five minutes of extra effort. You can get to a, a state that is beyond. So uh, how did he get five minutes extra? I don't recommend this to you. Uh, but, and uh, I didn't enjoy it as a kid. So that's a cup of coffee on the left, it's very hot. And on the right is this cylinder made of a lot of surface area of, of aluminum. And he would keep that in the freezer. So when he would come downstairs and there was coffee made, he would plunge that thing into the coffee so it was immediately the right temperature to drink. So you could get an extra five minutes of work. Now, uh, I really hate to have my personal credo reduced to a corporate slogan. But in a certain way, uh, I think it's true. And, and I've come to a point where I realize in my life that I'm never more ready to do things than I am at this moment. Whatever I have in me, I think I can get out at this point. And this is not uh, um, a process of maturity. I think it's a process of will. And I think you have to say, um, there's never a more inspiring world than today. There's never more information than I have. There's never more capability than is inside me now. So I encourage you to embrace that personally. Try it out. And I think it, I, I do hope it will make your productive lives even more productive. So that's what I have to say about uh, the beyond in, in my life. But I thought I'd, I'd give some uh, examples of what we do at the Dali and, and how uh, I've tried to move the Dali Museum beyond. So that's where we started. It would make a very good CBS drugstore. <laughs> and, and, and we were able to, to build this building, which is so, so useful to us. So that's the, the uh, uh, video version of a virtual reality experience that's upstairs, uh, and uh, you can navigate it yourself. This was something put together uh, for us by one of our board members, uh, which is the uh, Jeff Goodby of the Goodby Silverstein Agency. Um, we want to do more. We want to let you get into the paintings. Uh, we want to be more than a place to hang paintings. Um, we want to be able to move. Uh, not only images, but ideas. Um, we've opened ourselves to poetry readings. Uh, we created a wish tree, which is quite like, it's amazing how it takes the place of, of churches and temples for many people. And we get these wonderful wishes made. And I would recommend you make one today. It's a, it's a great way to cast your first vote for your own future and what you intend to do. 
Uh, we have a, we've gone online with uh, publications about the avant-garde scholarly publications. We remain a place that's free for school groups uh, so that children know not only uh, the kind of inspiration art can bring, but also that there's a place, a physical place that in their community is theirs and they're welcomed, which is you know, very important. We also go out to the schools with a, a, a mobile home that's full of art and, and uh, images. Uh, we send our art around the world, and that's a line of people in Brazil. That's about a, a 20th of the line. We had 10,000 visitors a day go through that for a three-month period. A million people in, in uh, Sao Paulo saw this show. And, and that's created a problem for us. <clears throat> so we, uh, we have, we'd like to export our experience. <clears throat> we'd like to share it as widely as possible. But uh, you know, our business model is to have our paintings here. So we are faced with uh, a, a problem. We want to export absolutely everything wonderful about art, uh, the way it shows human skill and the, the capability of the human imagination, the way it shows that the world is a matter of creative interpretation and that it's malleable and that you have to see it in multiple ways. Those great lessons we want to export. We want to export absolutely everything except our art itself. So we are going to create now, we're in the process of trying to figure out how to do this to create a, a virtual experience that will be in real spaces around the world and circulate multiple uh, spaces like this, like, like uh, um, a mobile communities that can be uh, taken off a truck and opened up and, and give people the experience. So that's our, 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 our next beyond at the Dolly. That's our challenge, and, and thank you for letting me share that with you. How did you get involved in the Dali? What's your story there? Um, I was, uh, uh, I, I'm an academic and uh, entrepreneur and I had a publishing company and was hired by uh, USF in, in Tampa to run this thing called Graphic Studio. Uh, and uh, the board of the Dali didn't have any art people on it and they asked me to join the board. and. Um, I realized that this was an incredible collection that nobody really understood in, in the community. Um, it hadn't been marketed well, and uh, I proposed to the board that I become director when the last director uh, resigned. So I sort of just asked for the position, the opportunity to do this. <laughs> and I had never run a museum before, but I had run businesses, so I think that's, uh, it seems to be more and more important with museums that they, they have to operate as businesses because the percentage of, of earned income to donated income is increasing all the time. It used to be that every cultural organization you know, had a, a, a city, a county, a foundation, a group of donors who would generously support it, but our, our society's moved in another direction. What would you say was one of the most difficult times of being a director for the Dali? Uh, well, there are a lot of people in it, and um, it, people have a lot of needs, and you want to meet them. It's, it's difficult to meet everybody's expectations. You have a, uh, it's that push and pull. Uh, we have wonderfully creative people, and they lead the museum forward, and, uh, and, and then there's just the ordinary problems of everybody getting them together and being of one mind. Uh, the hardest thing was to raise the money for this building, though, in terms of a specific activity, because we got a little governmental help. Uh, we actually did it at every level. We got city, county, state, and federal monies, but only to about uh, a third. And the rest we had to raise from private sources. Yes? So how has your creative process changed since you started working with the Dolly? Has Dolly's work severely influenced how you do things? Yeah, I think that the, uh, the, the permission he gives to uh, crazy ideas has helped me a lot. Um, it's, it's kept me from being too linear in my thinking. Yeah, it's been an inspiration. I mean, just being around art uh, makes you think differently, as you all know. <laughs> yes? Uh, what is one time that a crazy idea sort of won out, the one that everyone kind of at first was like, there's no way that'll work? And then the, that crazy idea of one for just, Dolly or, or any time in your professional life. 
just about every show you do. <laughs> Frida Kahlo, you, you, you can't get a good collection of Frida Kahlo, we, you know, so it was a crazy idea. But we, we managed to, it took years, years of negotiation to, to get the collection. Uh, which Dali piece do you connect with most and why? Oh, that's nice. Uh, I, th I think I, I love that little one I, I showed that was called The Weaning of Furniture and Nutrition in which the nursemaid sitting on the beach, there's a hole in her body, uh, uh, and then the, the bedside table is here, and then a little table and a bottle are all pulled out of these forms. So it, I, I love it because it's tiny. It's absolutely consummately achieved. It's, he painted with a tiny little brush, like three or four, hairs of the ermine tail, you know, just to make the finest marks possible. And then it uh, resonates on every level. So it's really about, you know, displacement. Um, weaning is displacing a child from his mother. Yeah, you wean them from the mother. And then so the nursemaid who weaned him from his mother has part of her body weaned away, you know, giving milk, being sapped from that way. And, and then the furniture is even weaned from itself, <clears throat> and then you realize that Dolly painted this when he's been displaced to uh, another country because of the Civil War. So it's like, it's working at every level, and yet it's just simple and by itself, and, and also enigmatic. 